right, I've got a question for you guys, especially you guys outside. How's your faith today? How's your faith today? I mean, that's a question that I think we need to remind ourselves of. We need to ask ourselves on a constant basis. Because so many times as Christians, what happens for us is we've got this idea. Some people at least have this idea. Okay, got Jesus. Got Jesus. I have, by God's grace, through faith, trusted what Jesus did on the cross. And therefore, I'm saved. You are. I'm forgiven. You are. I am a child of God. You are. And I'm going to heaven, which is all that matters. No, it's not. It's not all that matters. That's the deal. See, faith was and is for now. It's for this life. Faith isn't for what comes into eternity. Yeah, it gets us to eternity, but faith is for what happens now. The idea is that God introduces us into the family by faith, but it's a faith that's supposed to be growing. Unfortunately, what I found over the course of my Christian life is that most Christians, and I don't think this is an overstatement, most Christians get to a point where they plateau, stagnate, and then begin to decline in faith. They don't reject Jesus, but they get mature. They adopt, I think, a false form of maturity where they start thinking, well, you know, I've been around enough. I've seen enough of life. I just know that all that stuff that you read about in the Bible, all that stuff that, that, that preachers try to pump you up to believe, it just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. Well, you know, this is a dangerous place to be. That is a dangerous place to be. I don't want that to be the place where we are. I mean, what Jesus describes in Scripture is a group of people, disciples, that are supposed to be maintaining childlike faith, a childlike approach to their relationship with God. Not childish, but childlike. Childlike where we, we continue to have this expectation, this expectation that, that God is good, that God does make promises that he intends to keep. And we become increasingly and not decreasingly people that, that, that go after that. I mean, what we want to do here, I mean, we, we talk about all the time, building a culture of faith. Building a culture of faith is built on four, four pillars that we talk about all the time, but that I'll remind you of because you probably don't remember what they are that we talk about all the time. God is good. God is good. He's always good. He describes himself as good. We're living from a victory and not for a victory. That is, Jesus Christ won the victory for us on the cross, and we're not by our works working towards that victory. And that gives us a place of security to occupy. We are a people, number three, pillar of faith, who believe, who want to choose to believe, who want to continue to grow in believing that nothing is impossible with God or for the one who believes God. And then number four, that you were put here for a purpose. You were uniquely designed by God. You're a one-of-a-kind creation. And that's not something to, to pump you up into pride, but it's, again, a revelation of what God has made in terms of what he wants us to know. So we want to grow in those things, hold on to those things, build on those things. So what is it, what is it to have that growing faith? What, what's involved in all of this? Well, again, it's basically trusting God. It's trusting the work that's already been done for us and not believing that we've got to pump something up and create something. Uh, let's look at 2 Corinthians 1.20. It encapsulates it. We've talked about it so many times before, but pay attention what it says here. For as many as are the promises of God, the promises in the Bible, in him, that is in Jesus, the promises have been proclaimed, yes. They've been purchased by God. They've been purchased through the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore also, through Jesus, is our amen. That is, as we believe that he bought them, we say, okay, let them be done. That's what amen means. Let it be done, God. Let the promises be done to the glory of God through us. So we're saying we're looking at trust. We're looking at faith. We're looking at believing God as, in essence, constantly believing what Jesus did on the cross, what it accomplished, and how it purchased for us the right to stand believing all of these promises, and continuing to be a people who grow in these promises. I want to look at four base, basic faith principles that, that come into play with this. Four basic faith principles today that I think we need to keep in mind as we continue to, to strive to grow faith, to be people who, who choose to grow faith. Number one, number one, a base, basic, basic faith ingredient is we need to be people who believe when we don't see who believe when we don't see. What's that talking about? Hebrews 11.1. 1. Hebrews 11.1 1 defines faith that way. Faith is the assurance, the conviction, the idea 
that we do believe things that we don't yet see. I mean, if you see something, you don't have to have faith in it any longer, right? It's only the unseen things that are in the future that are not yet here that we have to have faith in. So we need to be people, number one, that believe those things that we don't see and continue to grow in that. Number two, number two, we need to receive when we don't deserve it. Again, this goes back to living from a victory, not for a victory. We need to be people that believe that we are, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, saved by grace through faith, but that not of ourselves is the gift of God. The idea is we have, we have been given an identity, a position with God, by God, through grace, and we need to receive the things that come as a result of the position we hold even when we feel like we don't deserve it. And again, this is an, ing- an ingredient in faith that needs to come in because, you know, I don't know if you figured this out yet, but you're never going to deserve it in terms of how you've acted. You're never going to deserve it in terms of keeping your slate completely clean. Number three, we need to obey even when we don't understand. I mean, that's another big aspect of faith, obeying when we don't even understand. This is how faith started off with Abraham, the father of faith in the Old Testament. He's told by God to go out somewhere. He doesn't know where he's going, doesn't know really why he's going there, but God says, go when he goes. He didn't understand it. It says in Hebrews 11, 8, he didn't understand it, but he went anyway. And that's what faith is. Faith is believing what we don't see. Faith is believing that we can receive even when we don't deserve it by our actions and Faith is obeying what God has said. Scripture, the commands, and the promises, even when we don't understand them. And then number four, maybe the hardest part, staying faithful when I don't feel like it. Staying faithful when I don't feel like it. We need to be a people who do that, who remind each other that we need to do that, that we, we stay faithful even when things take too long. We stay faithful even when the circumstances continue to point against what we, what we think they ought to be looking like. I mean, faith is living. It's continuing to live as if God is for us, with us, and loves us. <clears throat> what, what we're looking at is, again, a big picture overview here. A big picture overview of of life as Genesis to Revelation lays it out. I mean, what does it tell us in Genesis? It tells us in Genesis that God created man, mankind, men and women for a relationship with him. But what happened is that we, we fell out of faith. We fell out of faith. We quit trusting God. The enemy came in, tempted Adam and Eve, and they, they quit believing God. And then what is the rest of the Bible all about? I mean, in, in a sense, the rest of the Bible from then on is about God wanting to see that, that trust in him put back in place and that trust in him growing, that faith in him continuing to grow bigger and bigger. And so as a people that join together in, in life, we want to know what it is that, that that's supposed to look like for us. What is it that it's supposed to look like for us? I mean, we're not talking about faith in the abstract. We're not talking about faith in an academic sense. We're talking about faith in real life living. And the truth is, is that it looks different in different people's lives. It looks different in different seasons of life. It looks constantly different, and we need to remind each other in the varying and constantly changing circumstances that it's still faith that needs to come into play. I mean, in my life, I know I've seen different forms and flavors of faith depending on the season of life I'm in. I mean, you you look at when you first come to to salvation. There's a form of faith, a different form of faith that's needed to, to actually believe that you were born separated from God and that you need to believe what Jesus did on the cross was necessary to be restored to relationship with God and to be forgiven and to, to be in a position of love and acceptance from God. That's fine and good. That's, that's one form of faith. But then things change as you, you go along. I mean, as I first came to that form of faith, I thought, okay, this is good. This is good. But then really quickly after that, it was another form of faith that was needed that, that said, okay, well, now I'm a 20-something Christian and I like girls, but I'm not married. So what's faith look like then? Well, faith then takes on a different form. Faith then takes on the form of believing that, that God's command that you, you stand pure until marriage is something that you hold into place and that, that God will take care of that. And so that happened. 
a wife came along. I had faith for that, and it occurred. Different form of faith came later when children started popping into the picture, literally. The, the, the idea is then, you know, you've got to have a different form of faith that you can support them, that you don't mess them up, that you, you know, can do what's necessary to train them up in the way they should go. Different form of faith comes in when tragedy comes into your life, right? Different form of faith comes in when you lose somebody you love. Different form of faith comes in when you feel like you're supposed to be praying for healing for somebody you love. Different form comes in when you're moving through a broken relationship, when you're moving through financial catastrophe. Again, the point is, different flavors and forms of faith come in at different points in life, and we need to understand how to handle it. We need to understand how to continue to grow it and not let it decrease because of the circumstances. What I'm getting to is this. This sounds all very disjointed maybe to you right now, but what I'm talking about today is a concept of we need to be people who learn how to protect the recipe, protect the recipe, protect the recipe of faith that God has for our life. Now, you know, sometimes on these one-off Sundays, and that's what this is. We're between series right now. We just finished a series on prayer. We're moving into a long series on Ephesians. And, you know, I struggle. I struggle to come up with the one-off Sunday messages that are supposed to come into play. And oftentimes that'll bring a scripture to mind. This week he didn't. He brought instead a little clipping to mind that I happened to read. It was on Kentucky Fried Chicken. But it led to scripture, it led to, I think, something that really he wants to have us grab hold of today. The deal is this, okay, you know Kentucky Fried Chicken, special recipe chicken, the original recipe chicken. Well, there was an article I came across about how Kentucky Fried Chicken guards its chicken recipe. I mean, maybe you've seen this before, you can look it up. Um, they take some extreme measures. They keep the chicken recipe for the original recipe chicken in a safe at KFC headquarters in their legal department. Only one person in the world knows the combination to the safe, which does not seem like a good idea to me, but that's the way they've got it set up. And only two people in the entire world know which 11 herbs and spices actually go into the recipe and how much of each. And in fact, Kentucky Fried Chicken uses two different companies to make the recipe for them. One does one part and another does the other part so that nobody knows how they all go together. And then they use this computer generating process system to blend those together. I mean, they're going to some extreme lengths to, again, protect the recipe. I mean, what I think we need to understand is, is that, that actually God tells us the same thing in Scripture. He, he has put together a recipe for faith, a recipe for faith, a recipe for life, a recipe for how you and I can have the best life possible. He's put it together. And if we protect the recipe and we put all the right ingredients in in the right measure, then life's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be without trouble, but it is going to be the best life possible for you. But if we don't protect the recipe, if we don't put the right ingredients in in the right measure, apply the right heat, and follow the instructions for cooking it, then we're going to end up with something a lot less than it could be. 1 Timothy 4.16 says it this way. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Other NIV says to your doctrine. Persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. It says the same thing in Jude, chapters 3 and 4, where it says, watch out. Take great care with, with what's going on so that you don't have anybody sneaking in who messes up the recipe, who turns things around in the wrong direction and, and gets you in, into trouble with it. What I think we need to understand today, and the one ingredient that I want to focus in on that sometimes overlooked, is as we develop faith... It's never done in isolation. As we grow our faith, as we maintain it and continuing, continue to see it get bigger and bigger, which is what God wants to have, we do it in connection with other people. I mean, have you ever thought about it in terms of the Bible, what the Bible reveals? The Bible reveals that, that we are to be discipled in connection with other people. I mean, discipleship involves other people, period. There's, there's, no, there's no autonomy in terms of how discipleship occurs. There's no isolation that is supposed to take place in terms of, of, of 
how we go about growing faith. Let's take a look at Proverbs 18.1. Proverbs 18.1 says it this way. He who separates himself seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all sound wisdom. There are other paraphrased translations that say he who separates himself is stupid. I mean, that's basically what this boils down to. Isolation is, is an ignorant place to be. It's not where any of us should want to be. It's not where any of us are going to be safe. Um, there was a conference on the mainland a few years ago, um, and there was a, a very prominent pastor that was speaking. I'm not going to name his name, and you'll see why in just a minute. Um, prominent pastor who was speaking, and one of the things he did at this conference was share some very sobering statistics. They are as follows. He said, 1,500, 1,500 pastors leave ministry in the United States each month due to moral failure, burnout, or contention within their churches. 1,500 a month. He said 50% of pastors' marriages end in divorce. 70% of pastors fight chronic depression. 40% of pastors have had extramarital affairs since they started ministry. Okay? None of those apply to me. I'm not trying to elicit sympathy or ask for intervention here. So that's not what we're talking about. Point, point is this, though. This is where we get to. Same pastor who presented that information passionately. He understood it well. Same pastor abused his position, shut out all efforts of accountability, and pursued inappropriate relationships outside of his marriage with more than one woman and was removed from ministry. What's the point in that? Well, the point in that is he knew all the right stuff. He, he loves Jesus. He really does, I believe, loves Jesus. Still does love Jesus. But what was the missing ingredient? People, accountability. I mean, he isolated himself. And isolation brings destruction. I mean, that's what Solomon said right there in, in Proverbs 18.1. Now, I believe Proverbs was inspired by the Holy Spirit, but I also wonder if Solomon wrote that one, whether he was thinking back to his daddy. I mean, David, the big downfall with Bathsheba came in what context? When he didn't hang out with the guys that he was supposed to be hanging out with, fighting the battle, but instead isolated himself because he was too tired, because he had other things that he preferred to do, and stayed home walking around on the rooftop, you know, looking at naked women. And, and then destruction came. Destruction came. I mean, isolation is, is something that is always going to be an issue that has to be dealt with. We need people around us. Again, discipleship, discipleship always happens in, in relationship. It's why, as a church, you know, we want to grow bigger. But as we grow bigger, we want to grow smaller because the idea is as any church, any organization, any family grows bigger, unless they at the same time somehow figure out a way to grow smaller, then the isolation is going to occur. People get lost in the shuffle. There's not going to be that, that connectivity that needs to come into play to, to make things work the way they're supposed to work. I mean, the, the thing is this. We were, we were actually created by God for this, this matter of relationship. If you, you look back again at Genesis, where it always starts, you've got God creating man for relationship with him, with God, certainly. But look at the picture of what's described in the creation story. God creates everything, and he goes, it's good, it's good, it's good, until he gets to Adam. And he goes, no, nah, man, you're not so good. You're not so good. Now, okay, we look at that, and you think, wow, God blew it. I mean, he had everything going perfectly up until he creates Adam, and then he, he realizes he made a mistake. Well, of course God didn't make a mistake. And of course God, God didn't know when he created Adam that Adam was incomplete, that it was an incomplete picture. It, God wasn't surprised. He, he didn't make Adam and go, oh boy, I blew that one. You know, I should have done that a little bit differently. Now he knew it was incomplete and the narrative is put together in a way that just shows us the incompleteness as God created Adam. And then he created Eve. And so we say, well, that's all about marriage. No, it's not. It's not about marriage really at all. I mean, yes, it is because they got married, I guess, but, but you, you, you can't see it as that, but rather about relationship. Why? Because you get to the New Testament and the Apostle Paul says, in fact, everybody's not supposed to get married. There are some people that aren't supposed to be married at all. 
but they're still, still, still in relationship, still supposed to have relationship. You, you see, the point of the, the, whole, the whole deal is this. God created us, a lot of us, most of us for marriage, but not everybody for marriage, but everybody, 100% of us, designed for relationship, designed so that we, we live life together. We can't ever become everything we're supposed to be by ourselves. We can't ever become all that God intends us to be, fulfill all the purposes that God has for us, as long as we continue to live in isolation. Came across another great study this week. Um, It's a new one. See, usually, you know, some of you have already figured this out. We've got small group signups today. This is about signing up for small groups, getting connected. I'll let the cat out of the bag in case you haven't connected the dots yet. Yes, I'm going to make a big push at the end of today for you to sign up for small groups. And normally, I pull out this study that says if you don't join a group, your, your chances of dying have increased by 50%. I mean, true. It is true. This is true. And, and so the, the motto we've had for years is join a group or die. Join a group or die. Half of you are going to die this year because you don't join a group and you could have lived if you had joined a group. And these are absolutely true studies. All of Maida County study. Got named Jim Putnam. Put this stuff together. Really good stuff. But I figured this is getting old. So I found a new one. This is a brand new one from Dartmouth. Dartmouth University has put together a study called Hardwired to Connect, the new scientific case for authentic communities. They had a panel of of doctors and researchers, some 30 or 40 odd doctors and researchers, that studied the rising rates of mental illness, behavioral problems, and emotional distress in American children and teens. They came up with several key findings, and I want to share five of them with you. Number one, they found that humans are chemically predisposed to form close relationships. Okay, this is a secular study. Secular study, okay? Not Christian. Humans are chemically predisposed to form close relationships. They said our biology works best in enduring, nurturing relationships. We have been hardwired to connect with other people. Number two, if a child experiences close, nurturing relationships while growing up, the brain is profoundly affected for the better. Good news. Number three, this is also good news, but if you did not grow up this way, the genetic vulnerabilities can be overturned by future close contacts. That part I didn't know. What they cited was a a study done on a group of rhesus monkeys divided into three subgroups and studied over several generations. The first group, three subgroups of monkeys, okay? First subgroup uh, had a genetic vulnerability to anxiety and timidity. That's some of us, right? Second subgroup had a genetic vulnerability to aggression and poor impulse control. Also some of us. And the third group was filled with highly nurturing monkeys. Now, what they found was when the first and second groups were given access, that is the ones vulnerable to anxiety and timidity and to aggression and poor impulse control, when the first and second groups were given access to negative negative environments, the effects were harmful. For example, they gave them, at different points in time, unlimited access to alcohol. And I didn't know monkeys drank that much, but these particular subgroups of monkeys then drank heavily and suffered early death, and suffered early death. But when these first two subgroups, the ones anxiety-ridden and the ones that were aggressive, were allowed regular interaction with the third group, the nurturers, they thrived. And in fact, over time, anxiety, timidity, and aggression disappeared completely. Disappeared completely. So again, a secular study. We're just talking biology here. But you understand, when we're talking biology, we're talking... God's design. We're talking how God put us together. And to me, these things all come together in a way that that ought to get our attention in terms of what you and I were designed to do and be. Okay, number four, number four, continuing on with the study. They said that humans are also biologically primed to seek moral and spiritual meaning. Again, secular study. Simply put, they said, it's a quote, it's built into our DNA to want to connect with God and others. The conclusion of the entire study, nurturing relationships and a spiritual connection to the transcendent significantly improve physical 
and emotional health. Now again, you can look up the study, but you don't need to, because all it does is once again, give us that, 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 that example of, of science confirming what the Bible has said all along, that this is how God put us together, that God put us together for our good this way. He put us together in a way in which he intends for us to, to fully live out his purposes, and that's something that happens in relationship. I mean, these matters of, of having four pillars of faith that can support our faith, Th- this matter of, of having these ingredients of faith come in and stay in where we believe what we don't see, where we continue on even when we don't feel like it. I mean, this is where we have to have people around us. This is where you can't just hold yourself away and, and think that, that by yourself, you're going to be built back up because God didn't create you that way. God didn't create any of us that way, no matter what you think your, your personality type might be. See, it, it's, not, it's not okay to just say, well, I'm an introvert, and therefore I don't need this to thrive. Apparently, you may be more uncomfortable with it than extroverts, but you still need it to thrive. We still need that connectivity to come in at, at, at some level. I mean, the, the truth is you can, you can kind of see the reality of this as you think about your own life. I mean, think back over your own life in terms of how your faith has developed. I mean, most everybody I ever talked to in terms of giving a testimony, giving a testimony of their life as a Christian, it will always, it will always involve the mention of some names it will involve the mention of some people that either introduced them to Jesus in the first place or were pivotal in in helping them to continue to grow in their faith. These these are providential relationships that God brings about that that happen in in everybody's life. God uses these relationships for good. They can also be used for the other direction. Let's take a look at Proverbs 13.20. Proverbs 13.20 says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. So it goes in both directions. We can be influenced for good or for bad. I mean, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, bad company corrupts good morals. I mean, we ought to know that. But, but the point is, right now, we're looking at the, the flip side. How can faith continue to increase? How can you see your faith increased on a consistent basis? Well, one of the ways is simply getting around the right people, having the, the right people in your life on a day in and day out basis. I mean, again, think how it's been in the past and look ahead to how it can be in the future. I, I, I know for me, it's absolutely been that way. Absolutely been that way. I, I mean, I, I was introduced to the supernatural before I became a Christian. I mean, I've told you the story before. In 1975, I go to my brother's high school graduation. I don't believe in Jesus at this point. Well, maybe I do, but I'm not living it anyway. But I go to my brother's high school graduation, and there's this guy named Jamie Buckingham, who at the time was kind of a, a big name in the charismatic renewal. And he was the baccalaureate speaker at the, the high school graduation. And it's, it's raining. It's Florida. It's 10 o'clock in the morning on a summer day, so raining is what it normally does. And so it's raining, and he comes out onto the field and gets a microphone, and in front of God and everybody, he says, God, let your sun shine through on these graduates. Let your sun shine through on these graduates. And within seconds, within seconds, the sun is shining through on that stadium. It's still raining all around the stadium, dark clouds all around the stadium, but the sun is shining through on the stadium. And I'm looking at that going, what in the world is going on here? Now, that did not cause me to get on my knees and repent and follow Jesus. But it was something that I tucked away, that I, I pondered, and I looked at it and I go, that was real. I mean, I've never seen anybody do that before. I've never, I've never seen anybody pray for something and then actually get what they prayed for right after they prayed for it. And now, following that, I, I got involved in, in his church in Melbourne, Florida, and was able, again, through a providential connection, to have an introduction to, to the supernatural in terms of you know, God actually still does a lot of the stuff that we, we read about in the Old Testament and the New Testament. He still does it. He still does it. And, you know, what brought that about? For me, it wasn't simply reading in the Bible and then intellectually saying, well, it says it here, so I need to keep believing it. I mean, we should think that way, but most of us don't. It takes a providential relationship where we see somebody who, who's a little bit further along than we are, who we see acting it out 
doing the stuff that's there. Then, you know, moving on, I mean, in life, I, I've had the same thing happen with, with a couple of other occasions. I mean, two very good friends that I've got back in Florida, still good friends of mine, met both of them in small groups, coincidentally. And, you know, they were, they were two guys that, that introduced me to what it looked like for men to love other men unconditionally, wanting their best. I mean, these are two guys that when I was, you know, when our family was making the decision to transition from Florida to Hawaii, were asking me questions. They didn't just say, oh, whatever you want, go for it. I mean, they asked questions. How are you going to do this? What are you going to do? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And, and then at the conclusion of the questions, they both were guys that said, you need to go for this. You've got the potential. They didn't say I had it all together. They just said, you've got the potential. You've got the potential. And they encouraged me to go for it. They, they financed me to go for it. They put their money where their mouths were. And they continued to do that for years. I mean, it was, again, a, a providential relationship, providential relationships, evidencing the faithfulness of God in, in making provision, in, in what it looks like to be somebody who, who's an encourager, who's an encourager. Um, I mean, the list goes on. I mean, the list goes on, and I'm not going to bore you with all my stories, but the point is this. You've got the same things that I'm almost certain have happened in the past in your life. But what I am completely certain of is that they are things that can happen in the future in your life. That God has providential relationships yet in store for you that are going to help you grow faith. That are going to release you more fully into the potential that you have, into the purposes that God has for you. But you've got to take some action on it. You know, when you use that word providence, sometimes people just say, well, that's all God. Providence is all God, right? I mean, no, it's not. It's not all God. Providence is something that God provides a door for. He provides the potential for, and then we have to take action to step into it. Faith is the same way. Faith is what? Faith is based on the promises of God, which we can talk about as hope. Hope put out in the future. Faith is the action that we take to go towards the hope, towards the promises of God. Think about um, um, Joshua. Joshua 10. That's that bit that you're familiar with where um, Joshua prayed and the sun stood still? I mean, God caused the sun to stand still because he wanted Joshua and Israel to win this battle. So providential, yeah, I'd say that's providential. God caused the sun to stand still. Providential, God wanted the, the Israelites to win the battle. But what was connected in with that that we sometimes miss in the story? In order for Joshua to have the sun stand still and to win the battle, he had to lead the Israelites first in a march that lasted all night to get to the point of winning the battle. They had to march all night to get there. So, I mean, would it have happened if they had marched all night? No, it wouldn't. They had to take action based on the promise of God in order to see the fulfillment of the providential outcome that God intended to have occur. It's the same thing with you and me. God, I believe, I mean, you can check scripture out on this and punch holes in this, but I don't think you'll be able to do it. I think that God right now, today, has providential relationships out in front of me, providential relationships out in front of you that are a part of the plan that he has for you to step into the fullness of what he has for you, for you to come, become completely successful in life, which means you fulfill all the purposes that he has for you in life. But in order to have those providential relationships actually connect, in order for the connectivity of lives to come into play, you have to make some choices. I have to make some choices and take action. You might have to march all night somewhere. You might have to march right outside of the sign-up tables for the small groups. You might have to march to your computer to sign up online. Now, that said, I'm not trying to lay out for you guys that the only way to connect is in a Living Stones Church small group. But you've got to connect with somebody. It needs to be an intentional connection. You know, don't play around with that. Ah, you know, I always run into friends up at, up at uh, Kona Coffee and Tea or Starbucks. I mean, I always run into people up at Banyan Tree Cafe. We always sit around. I'm always talking to somebody. No, we're not talking about this amorphous, ambiguous, you know, stuff that you call relationship, which, which has no intentionality about it. We're talking about coming into relationships that are intentional with people that you've got connection with on a regular basis. The same people week in and week out. The same people week in and week out. 
over time where they know who you are and you know who they are. You're known. They become known. And you live life together. You live life together. You share life together. There's a kind of accountability that comes into play where they ask you questions and you answer them, where you put yourself in a position not only to gain the benefits of providential relationships, but you put yourself in a position where you go, you know what? I might be the providential relationship for somebody. You thought of it that way? I mean, some of you are saying, I don't need any more providential relationships. My life's going fine. Well, great. You may be the providential relationship that somebody else needs is the point. It's stepping in and again doing it intentionally. Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24, 25. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I mean, read that yourself when you get home. It's talking about intentional choices and intentional effort. It's talking about doing some things that you may not particularly want to do, but, but doing them anyway. It's, it's looking at the idea that, again, if you're living out your Christian life in isolation, you're living out a form of Christian life that's only partially correct. And in order to see the fullness of faith develop, you've got to protect the recipe. You've got to step in and understand that God put together this recipe. He designed you in a certain way, and you're never going to turn out exactly as good as you could. You're never going to be. I'm never going to be the best I can be apart from the recipe that God has included, and everybody needs it. I mean, Jesus had a small group, right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your amazing love, your goodness, your grace, we thank you for the revelation you've given us in Scripture and, and just the revelation you bring to the minds of people in terms of, of how you've created us, how you've put us together. Father, I, I, I ask that you'd help us. Help us to walk in the humility necessary to live according to design, to protect the recipe that you've put together for life and to, to step fully into the purposes that you've got for us so that we together can see your will done on this earth as it is in heaven so that we can see your kingdom extended throughout this earth all of it father we ask in the power of jesus christ's name amen